statistics state, theoretical evidence dictates that I am to be high or dead right now. And the fact that I'm not is, is A, miraculous, equaling a miracle, and B, it defies logic. May 25th, 2015, I found myself at a position in life where the pain became so fucking great that for the first time in my life, I was willing to do anything that was suggested in order to get myself out of the position that I, Brandon Novak, had continuously created for myself. May 25th, 2015, I found myself at a position in life where I was divinely, where I was divinely inconvenienced in just such a manner that the God of my understanding showed up and created just a big enough gap between me and the last speedball that I stuck into my arm to allow me to have a moment of clarity to see what my life really looked like was. And at that moment, on that time, in that day, for the first time in my life, I was no longer accepting of the outcome that I continuously created for myself. May 25th, 2015, I was walking into my 13th inpatient treatment center. I had lost count of outpatients and detoxes. My mother had bought me a plot. People had begun to take life insurance policies out on me. May 24th, 2015, the day before that I walked into that 13th inpatient treatment center, I found myself coming to, after being on life support for seven days at Mercy Hospital in Baltimore City, the very same hospital that my mother is a nuclear physicist at, on the board of. So my family reunion would look like every, sometimes two or three times in a month, sometimes once a month, sometimes once every four months, my mother would get a call in her department, which was nuclear medicine, and they'd say, hey, Pat, Brandon's back. Hey, Pat, Brandon's back. My mother had sold three homes to financially pay for me to go to two different treatment centers. I had been medevaced to four different hospitals in four different states with four different overdoses. In the beginning of my alcoholism, my mother, she used to get on her knees. She used to get on her knees and pray to God, please, God, do not let tonight be the night that I received that call. Please don't let tonight be the night that I received that call that my son has succumbed to his addiction and he's no longer with us. Please don't let tonight be the night. Two, at the end of my run, a 38-year-old homeless heroin addict who wants to kill himself on a daily basis. I just don't want to fucking hurt myself in the process. Terrible at suicide because I keep waking up. At a position in life where I'm so low, the curve looks like a skyscraper. My mother, God bless her soul, my mother gets on her very same knees and she prays to the very same God, please God, please let tonight be the night that I finally receive that call. Please God, let tonight be the night that I finally receive that call that my son has finally overdosed and succumbed to his addiction just so I can know he's finally safe once and for all. How the fuck did I get here? Even saying it today still sounds like a completely foreign entity coming out of my mouth, and I've repeated that a lot of times, but how the fuck did I get here? <clears throat> because I don't know about any of you fine ladies and gentlemen, but I had goals, I had dreams, I had aspirations, I had ambitions, I was going to be somebody. But the sad reality is the disease of addiction does not discriminate. From Yale or jail, the outhouse to the White House. One out of three people will be affected directly or indirectly. Today in the nation, 178 people will die as a direct result of an opioid overdose. My mother's a nuclear physicist. My brother is an attorney who works in the White House that practices pensions and benefits. My father taught me one thing in life. 
if and when I go to prison, how to conduct myself. Never held a job a day in his life. He ran with the Hells Angels, rather unsavory kind of fella, if you will. He acquired the liking of crack cocaine. His body shut down. He's no longer with us. Right? So I live with that after school special. I live with that cautionary tale of what an addict or an alcoholic looks like and what the drug or, or, or drink makes an individual do. Right? Because Jerome, my father, was the nicest guy in the world. Everybody loved Jerome. But when he didn't come home to make dinner at five and we heard him and his biker buddies pulling the parking lot at like three and the keys hit the lock, we shook like leaves because we... We knew what we were in for. So at that very moment, at a very young age, I understood the psychic change that takes place upon an individual once they ingest a drink or a drug. As a matter of fact, I made it a point to prove that I would never become that fucking bum. I will never become that man. And anything that I do in my life, I will excel at just to prove that I'll never be my father. And at the right young age of seven, I was blessed with the ability to be given my first skateboard. And that night when my mother, God bless her, that night when my mother put me to bed with that first skateboard, she said, Brandon, what would you like me to do with this skateboard? And I said, I want it in bed with me. She said, why? And I said, because if I die, I want it to go with me to heaven. The moment that board touched my hand, I knew I was going to be a skateboarder for the rest of my life. Right? Uh, I ate it. I breathed it. I slept it. I dreamt it. At 15, I was the first skateboarder to be endorsed by Gatorade. They were flying me to the Quaker Oats building where they made Gatorade at the time in Chicago. And, and they would strap me on this treadmill and they strapped Michael Jordan on the treadmill directly next to me. And they'd strap these EKGs to our chest and, and give us each Gatorade to see the different effects that it has on sports players. I'm designing a prototype shape for Pal Peralta. I'm touring the world with the Bones Brigade, Tony Hawk, Steve Caballero, Mike Vallali, fellas of that nature. From that very young age, doing some things in life that people would accredit to success, happiness, potentially even dream of doing. And the reason why I'm giving you the backstory of how I got to this point is because I really think it's important to, to paint this picture that, that at no point in time in my life did I sign up or resign to the notion that at 38 years old I want to be a homeless heroin addict standing on the corner of Eastern Avenue in Patterson Park allow men to blow me to acquire enough money to get another bag of heroin. How the fuck did I get here? How the fuck? <laughs> How the fuck did I get there? I had goals, I had dreams, I had intentions, I had ambitions, I was gonna be somebody, and most importantly, who I was not gonna become was my fucking father or a drug addict like him, proving a point to everybody. I never felt like I was in search of or lacking this ability to find happiness. Because as a matter of fact, skateboarding did for me at a very young age what drugs and alcohol did for me at a later age. Right, you give me a skateboard at the age of seven, you put me in a room with the world's prettiest models. I'll not only believe that they've been waiting for me, but that they're dying to marry me. I don't know what the fuck you're laughing at, that's the truth. <laughs> But drugs and alcohol later on down the road produced that same delusional narrative that I bought into hook, line, and sinker. So again, I'm just painting this picture of the fact that like I, I, I wasn't born looking for this happiness and, and, and the first time I fucking put that needle on my arm, I felt like, aha, I found the reason for which I'll jump out of bed for with the lust of life every day. That's not my story. And what I'm here to do today is to share with you my story. I'm not going to share with you your story or, or believe to understand the pain that brought you into these lovely seats at this lovely facility listening to my fucking mouth for an hour. That's not fair to me or you. Right? Because I'm going to bring it back and what I do know is the wheelhouse of the people that I'm talking about, if, if you can relate to being an addict or an alcoholic such as myself, all that means is that we're defiant by nature, we hate authority and we refuse to conform. Right, because I don't know if you're anything like me, but I possess this job that places me in a lot of positions I don't like to be in. And it allows me to feel a lot of feelings I don't like to feel, and that job consists of knowing everything. Right, so, so thank you, Avila. Thank you, Sharif, for, for kindly suggesting to me what I could 
potentially do to, to save my life, but I'm gonna kindly suggest why you should fuck off because I know. May 25th, 2015, walking into my 13th inpatient treatment center. Everything I owned in this life consisted of eight scarves, two jackets, three socks, a stick of deodorant, fit into a bag that doubles my pillow, a needle, a spoon, and a restraining order. The reality set in that you know what I do know is that I have no fucking idea. And my very best thinking places me in a position like this, sitting in a lovely fucking seat or chair like that, listening to someone such as my mouth for an hour. At best. So if you can relate to anything that I just shared with you as being an addict or an alcoholic, what my job here today to do before my people is to share with you my message in a form of attraction rather than promotion. I'm going to give it to you in such a way that I hope you find so desirable, so appealing, so attractive, so much so that you like want to fuck it. If I can get you to want what I have so bad that you're willing to do anything that I've done to get what I have, guess what? The terms of your contract will forever change. And you could be the next fucking billboard for recovery, sobriety, and you could be the next president of the United States and you could be the next brain surgeon of fucking California and you could be the next accountant for the next fucking presidency term. You know, the literally become anything you want. But unfortunately, I can't do this for you. It has to become your idea and you have to want it as bad as I want to share it with you so that when I'm finished my talk and I walk out this door and I get back in my car and I drive two and a half hours back to my hotel. If one person in this room says to themselves, if that motherfucker can do it, there's no reason why I can't. It makes my day worthwhile. So that's my agenda here today before you. So bringing it back, I don't recall the first bottle I put to my mouth, the first pill that I shoved down my throat, the first joint that I put to my lips, the first line that I sniffed up my nose. I don't recall that. But what I do recall, as sure as the day is long, like this pen is in my hand, is the first time that someone attempted to stand between me and it. And you're gonna hear in my story, anybody, anybody, any place or anything that attempts to stand between me and a drink or a drug must and will fucking go. And it's not personal, it's just business. Because I don't wanna do the things that I have to do to acquire another bag, but like, I'm sorry, it's, it's business. And what that looked like for me the first time someone attempted to stand between me and it was I was on a tour with a bunch of pro skaters and I was in, I was in, um, downtown Atlanta and we were doing a demo in the city at the skate shop and, and Mike Vallali had caught me with a lot of drugs and he said, Brandon, get rid of the drugs or get off the tour. I throw the drugs down the sewer, we finish the demo, I go back to the hotel, I meet a young lady at the hotel, she drives me back to said sewer, I fish the drugs out of the sewer. Short story long, I get caught with the drugs, I'm now kicked off the tour. Now see, my delusional alcoholic brain that I possess that lies to me in my own voice that makes me believe the unbelievable tells me that the skateboarding world needs me. It cannot go on without me and I am an asset. But the sad truth is the skateboarding world does not need me. It goes on quite fine without me and I am a liability. But unfortunately, I'm the last person to realize that. Why? Because I possess that job that consists of knowing everything. Right? So, so packages are no longer being sent. Tours are no longer being scheduled. Flights are no longer being booked. Video parts are no longer being produced. Why? Because to achieve such simple things in life as those, I have to have conversations that consist of words like honest, reliable, dependable. And, and I avoid that like the play because it does not help me get one more. And one day I'm sleeping, I'm throwing the phone by my mother and and I put the phone to my ear and it's my team captain for Pal Peralta and he said, Brandon, we have one or two options we could do with you. We could put you into treatment, you could save your life, you can continue to skate for Pal Peralta or you can quit the team. 
From seven to 16, I ate it, I breathed it, I slept it, I dreamt it. I'm the first skateboarder endorsed by Gatorade. I did a commercial with Michael Jordan. I'm touring the world with Tony Hawk and for the very first fucking time in my life, someone is attempting to stand between me and it and I don't even have a breath of fresh air in my lungs when I said I quit. The disconnection from reality that's already taken place at the ripe young age of end of 16 turning to 17 is astronomical, it's mind blowing. And I haven't even stepped into a facility yet. Now I'm enjoying my newfound freedom, this time off, this unexpected leave of absence. And about two months into this process, my mother and my girlfriend come to me and they said, Brandon, we have a great idea for you. I said, what's that? They said, we want you to go to treatment. Why the fuck would I just accept it from them if I turned it down for my team captain here in Santa Barbara at the Powell Warehouse? The abnormal has already become the normal and I haven't even entered my first treatment center. I said, you know what? That's a great idea. A, I have the time. B, I'm gonna report to said treatment center and I'll report back to my mother and my girlfriend why I'm not you fucking nut jobs, nor will I ever be. This is merely an overreaction at best. You just caught me at a bad time, on a bad way, in a bad day. Tomorrow is going to be different. Strap me up to a polygraph, I will have every police officer in the world pat me on the back saying, Mr. Novak, we wish everyone was as honest as you are. The world would be a safer place to live in. That's how much I believe that tomorrow is going to be different. I'm not trying to sell you a fucking dream. Tomorrow is for real going to be different. But unfortunately, I wake up tomorrow to repeat yesterday's actions and I'm stuck in Groundhog's Day for like 22 fucking years. As quick as I agree, my bags are miraculously packed. Blink of the eye, I'm in a car and I'm being dropped off at the, the very first facility I have the luxury of entering at, at 17 years old in Baltimore City. I'm met outside by a very nice, kind, warming, like intake lady and she said, son, are you Mr. Novak? I said, yes. She said, come with me, sweetheart. And I'm carrying my bag and I, I get led into this this very big cafeteria, but this cafeteria is completely empty, not a soul in sight. Really bright interrogation style lights shining down on me. I'm ill as a research monkey. I'm detoxing off heroin. And out of nowhere, this older black gentleman walks in and he comes directly to me and he said, white boy, what are you doing here? I said, heroin. He said, how old are you? I said, 17. He said, do yourself a favor and don't turn 18 in a place like this. And as quick as he came, he left. He nor I had no idea the significance of that simple conversation was ever going to have on my life. Mind you, I'm comparing out, proving a point why I don't belong. This is just an overreaction at best. Focusing only on the differences, not the similarities because I will not relate to being one of you people because after all, you're my fucking father, fuck you. You know what I can tell you about that gentleman? Where the four teeth were placed in his mouth. Because at the time I had all mine. He's black, I'm white. He's 70 to 75, I'm 17. He smokes crack, I successfully do heroin. He's homeless, I live with my mother and my girlfriend. God bless that man, I'm so grateful he found the answer for which he's in search of. You know what I can't tell you about that facility? I can't tell you my therapist's name. I can't tell you about the relapse prevention packets they're shoving down my throat. The healthy and unhealthy boundaries they're trying to instill in me because if I can tell you about those things, that means I can relate to being one of you people and I want no fucking part. But I successfully completed that 30-day treatment center. I successfully completed it. And here's the hit, I didn't turn 18 in a place like that just like the old man predicted, fucking fool. The fuck is wrong with him? Why would he think that he could predict my out? What the, who the fuck does he think he is? Don't lose me. Here's the hit. I turned 19, 20, 22, 23, 25, 27, 28, 29, 32, 34, 35, 37, 38 in a jail or a treatment center. And every year I'd sit on whatever bunk of whatever cell, of whatever jail I happened to be in, or whatever bed, 
of whatever facility I happen to be in and think back to that older gentleman and say, maybe if me, myself, Brandon Novak would have listened to him with an open mind and an open heart, I would not continuously find myself in the same fucking situation year after year after year after year. Meaning that it was fully self-induced. I had now created or painted this picture for what you view me in. In between all those birthdays, in between all those years, I'm in and out of treatment, I'm in and out of treatment, and I come in here and I would like, I would like loiter with the intent to recover. Right? Because I would always get this therapist that was really easy on the eye, and my delusional alcoholic brain would tell me that she's dying to fuck me, at least maybe marry me. So, like, I'm going to be the model client that excels and lets her see how great I'm doing because she needs to know that I'm a fucking asset to her life. So she would say to me, okay, Mr. Novak, I'm going to need you to, uh, to get one of those sponsors done. I'm going to need you to, um, to join a home group, a 12-step meeting, done. I'm going to need you to, to create a, a fellowship of like-minded individuals such as yourself who are trying to achieve the same thing, which is make it through another day clean and sober. Pfft, got this. Because see, what I don't think my therapist understands is I was not the kid that would show up late to class in fear that you were staring at me. I was the kid that would show up 20 minutes late to class believing that you've been waiting for me. So everything that she's suggesting is like a Monday morning. Get a sponsor, hang out with people, go to a place where all these people meet and just fucking do you. And then she'd say, without fail, okay, Mr. Novak, but before you leave my office, I'm going to need you to go ahead and experience those 12 steps. And without fail, I'd say, I'm beginning to sense a theme of over-fucking-reaction here. It's Christmas Eve. 2009, I'm in a shooting gallery in West Baltimore. It's like 38 degrees at best. I have a short sleeve t-shirt on, a, a, a 3X white t-shirt. I have a pair of size like 40 jeans on with these Timberland boots. And I'm huddled up in the corner and my, my arms are in my shirt. My shirt's over my knees and my head's into my shirt and I'm because that's the only thing I can do to produce heat on this fucking Christmas Eve freezing cold night in the shooting gallery. How the fuck did I get here? What I've learned in my sobriety and really my life today is it's all in retrospect. Today my life is live forward and learn backwards. And it's very easy for me today with coming up on eight years sober to see how the fuck I got here. I got here because I sat there with a closed mind and a closed heart, comparing out, focusing only on the differences, not the similarities. Because I'm defiant by nature, I hate authority, I'll never conform, and after all, I possess that job that consists of knowing everything. That's how I got here. That's how I ended up huddled up in a shooting gallery on Christmas Eve, breathing through my nose and my mouth because it's the only thing that produces heat. That's how I get here. Now, in between all those years, I, I, I trip and I fall into those movies, Jackass, and these TV shows called Viva La Bam, and Now, see, just like in that skateboarding world, in this Jackass world, they say if we book him the flight, is he even going to make the flight? Let's say we book him the flight and he makes the flight. What condition will he be in when he gets here? Let's step out on a limb. Let's say we book him the flight and he actually makes the flight. Is the same thing that's going to happen as it did last time where we have to kick the bathroom door down at Paramount Studios and find him dead on the ground with a needle in his arm. Not a good look for the work world. But again, my delusional alcoholic brain, the one that I possess that lies to me in my own voice that makes me believe the unbelievable, tells me the jackass world needs me. It cannot go on without me and I am an asset. And in reality, it goes on quite fine without me. It does not need me and I'm a liability. Unfortunately, I'm the last person to realize that because I possess this job that consists of knowing everything. This is the only time I'm gonna ask for crowd participation. And what I'm gonna share with you is an absolute fact. Do not waste your or my time after I'm done this talk asking me about this. 
who's been diagnosed as an addict or an alcoholic and accepts the diagnosis. Don't shoot the messenger here. Remember this. I'm about to put you on with something. You might not like me in about a minute and a half. I'm innocent. But if you've put your hand up such as I have, and you stated that you're an addict or an alcoholic, and you accept the diagnosis that's been given to you, all that means for us that raise that hand is that we've been diagnosed with a disease that if left untreated equals death. Absolute fact. Fucking Google it. Look it up in any medical dictionary. Fact. Don't waste my or your time talking to me about that. But that's just like the fluff. That's not even what I'm about to like really share with you that's the scary part. Here's the hit. It's the only fatal disease that I've ever been diagnosed with that lies to me in my own voice, that makes me believe the unbelievable, that tells me that I am not an addict or an alcoholic. Right? It's not like your voice pops in my head and says, ah, Brandon, you can go shoot a bag of dope like a gentleman. You can drink a glass of wine like a fucking normal person. And I'm like, fuck you, stranger danger. <laughs> it's my voice that talks to me. Just as me. And it makes me believe the unbelievable. Follow me. So I'm diagnosed with HIV. I'm rushing to the hospital to get medication. I don't want to die. Fatal disease. If I'm diagnosed with cancer, I'm rushing to the hospital to get chemo. I don't want to die. Fatal disease. Diagnose me as an addict or an alcoholic. I need a glass of wine or a bag of heroin to figure out what the fuck's wrong with you for diagnosing me with said disease. <laughs> Just as fatal as the first two diseases. Left to my own devices, I will get in my rental car. I'll go to my bank. And believe this or not, I haven't partaken in a drink or a drug for quite some time, which means I've been able to save a lot of money. I'll pull out an undisclosed amount of cash from the bank. I'll ride around the way. I'm sure my Chiba dealer still lives in the same spot or his people. And I'll cop as much as I can physically fit into my arm. And the scariest thing about that is I can make those actions make complete sense to me right now. Right now, at this very moment. And if you're sitting there saying to yourself, what in the fuck would allow him to make such a foolish decision? He's like a, you know, I, I'm a motivational speaker. I'm an interventionist. I own a handful of sober living houses. I own a treatment center. I sponsor people. I have a sponsor. I am like the fucking epitome of recovery or sobriety at this moment. And literally, I will leave this, get in my car, and go make those moves happen. And if you're asking yourself, what would allow me to make a foolish decision such as that? It's, it's simple. Brandon only attends Brandon's Anonymous. Brandon only sponsors Brandon. And Brandon is Brandon's God. And when those three things are connected, it's not a matter of if, but when I recreate my history. I've seen me do it. This is not me, again, trying to tell you your story or what I think your projected outcome will be if you successfully or unsuccessfully complete or, or don't complete a villa. Like, no, I don't give a fuck. If you can relate to anything I share, then maybe take heed. If not, I'm your number one fucking cheerleader. I have no skin in this game. I don't. But what I know for me is it was the last thing I tried that was the first thing that worked. And again, looking back with my eight years of sobriety and, and, and countless hours of work, it's very easy for me to see that all I've done for the better part of my life is just rearrange the furniture on the Titanic. But that bitch sank every goddamn time. They say a hard head makes for a soft ass. I promise you, I have like the softest ass in this room. What the fuck are you perverts laughing at? <laughs> now my paychecks are being diverted to my second ex-fiance because they fear if I receive all this money that I'll surely die from Paramount and all that. And now it's going to my second ex-fiance because clearly they have a pattern of attempting to disrupt my behaviors or stand between me and my drugs and they have to fucking go. 
And the last one I really believe was gonna be like the one. And it's really sad to say that it's not the case as a direct result of my actions. Because see, now I've experienced the 12 steps and I've learned to be accountable and, 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 and recognize and accept the part that I played in the deal. <sighs> my mother's a nuclear physicist. My brother's an attorney in the White House. My father dies a direct result of the disease of addiction. First skateboarder endorsed by Gatorade, doing a commercial with Michael Jordan, touring the world with Tony Hawk. Trip and fall into these movies, Jackass, these TV shows, Viva La Bam. From an external perspective, I've done some things in life that people would have credit to success, happiness, potentially even dream of doing, but the reality of what my life really looks like is this. I've been in nine inpatient treatment centers. I've lost count of outpatients and detoxes. My mother, a few years back, she spent Mother's Day going to buy two plots, one for me and one for her, on Mother's Day. She sold three homes to pay for me to go to two different treatment centers. I've been medevac to four different hospitals in four different states with four different overdoses. Why the fuck would I go to treatment center number 10? Here's the hit. Speaking for myself, and I'm going to go ahead and venture to say for you that none of us get here because we took the short bus to school. Quite the contrary, actually. We get here because we're too smart for our own fucking good. And then we end up in a seat just like this. And I end up thinking myself right out of it. Because the craziest thing happens with recovery. It's one of the things that works so goddamn well, we stop doing it. Right? Everything comes back in abundance. The money, the fucking businesses, the pussy, the, the cars, the this, the, the money, the property. But it's all in abundance. It's back. Everything I wanted plus some. And I'm like, ah. Now those 12-step meetings have become an inconvenience. And I get that. I'm guilty of it. But why would I go to treatment center number 10? What's number 10 going to tell me that, that number 9, 8, 7, 6, 5, 4, 3, 2, or 1 is missed? Why would I waste my time or yours, Sharia? What the fuck's the point? I have a plan. I have a plan. I'm going to move to Helsinki, Finland. I don't know why the fuck you would laugh at my plan because it's sure proof. <laughs> I'm trying to paint a very clear, vivid picture of how disconnected from reality I really am. You're the fucking fool if you don't think that my plan is foolproof in my mind. It's literally across the world. They don't even speak my language. I'm going to go there. I'm going to recreate. I'm going to reaccess. I'm going to reappear. I'm going to reevaluate. I'm going to redo life because I do not like the results that I'm receiving in Westchester, Pennsylvania or Baltimore, Maryland. I jump on a plane from Philly, I fly to Helsinki. From Helsinki, I'm taken to the Ritz-Carlton of Helsinki because from a very young age, my mother used to tell me, show me who you walk with and I'll tell you who you are. Which transcended somewhere along the lines in one of my many attempts at one of my many facilities, me believing that one of my therapists said to me, social acceptability equals personal recovery, which is not true. But see, my delusional alcoholic brain will create these false narratives as long as they justify or support my relapsed behavior. So I really believe that a therapist told me social acceptability equals personal recovery. Therefore, as long as the, the home is big enough, the account is high enough, the woman is pretty enough, and the car is new enough, I got to be doing fucking well. So my mother tells me at a young age, show me who you walk with, I'll tell you who you are. Then that connects to social acceptability equals personal recovery. I fly to Helsinki, Finland to get a new outcome. And I go to the Ritz-Carlton of Helsinki because what fucking junkie stays at the Ritz-Carlton? I go to the concierge's desk, they take my belongings upstairs. I beeline it directly to the lobby bar. I pass these businessmen in these really expensive suits having these meetings in these different languages and I, I belly up to the bar and I order a glass of wine followed by a second. There's four glasses to a bottle. I've now graduated to a bottle. I meet a gentleman at the bar. He slides me a number. I'm now having black tar heroin delivered to me in abundance. I go into that bathroom and I'm doing what I do and I call one of my fucking sponsors from one of those fucking therapists that I really believed wanted to fuck and or marry me. 
And the reason why I keep going back to saying that is not to be funny, it's to say, I don't give a fuck what you're here for. I don't care what brings you here. All I care about is what keeps you here. Whether it's a job, whether it's a woman, whether it's your neighbor, the judge, the parole, whatever it is, I don't give a fuck what brings you here. I just care about what keeps you here. So I'm in the bathroom, I'm doing what I do, and I call one of those sponsors that I've only acquired to fucking impress the therapist I believe wanted to be with me. And I called Lex and I said, Lex, how did this happen? How am I here yet again? He said, well, if you have a second, Mr. Novak, I'd like to share with you something. But I know you're a really busy man with a really full itinerary, and after all, these international calls can become quite pricey. I said, what, Lex? I could see what he was doing. He said, I guess you skimmed over the part in the book where we discussed that, that geographical change does not equate to recovery. You can't shake your shadow. I put you in Finland, you shoot dope. I put you in California, you shoot dope. Your mother dies, you shoot dope. Your son's born, you shoot dope. You fucking clinicians toss around this word triggers. My triggers were when my eyelids open. <laughs> I'll justify why any time, place, feeling, or sensation makes sense to shoot a bag of dope over. He said, if you have another second, I'd like to share with you something else. But again, I know you're a really busy man with a really full itinerary and these international calls are quite pricey. What, Lex? He said, I want you to do me a solid. He said, I want you to stop what you're doing. He said, I want you to take that thing out of your arm. I want you to lift your head straight up and I want you to stare directly into the mirror in front of you and tell me what you see. He said, better yet, don't say a fucking word. I'm going to tell you what you see. Right now, you are staring directly into the eyes of your problem. You are your problem. This heroin and cocaine that you're shooting into your arm at this very moment is merely the solution to your problem. And for one of the very rare handful of moments in life, you're allowing somebody to stand between you and your solution. And at this moment, Mr. Day One, at this moment, you're feeling like a stranger in your own skin trying to figure out who the fuck let you in and why. And I said, you know what, Lex? These international calls are quite pricey. <laughs> right? My delusional alcoholic brain will create these narratives as long as they support me returning back to a drink or a drug. So with that, I go back to the concierge's desk. I have them go receive my articles from my room, which I never stepped foot in. I'm back at Helsinki Airport. I fly back to Philadelphia because clearly Helsinki is the problem. My mother's a nuclear physicist. My brother's an attorney in the White House. My father died as a direct result of disease of addiction. First skateboarder endorsed by Gatorade, doing a commercial with Michael Jordan, touring the world with the Bones Brigade. End up in these movies that break box office records. TV show wildly successful. <sighs> On the flip side of that coin, I've now been in 11 inpatient treatment centers. I've lost count of outpatients and detoxes. My mother has bought me a plot. People have begun to take life insurance policies out on me. My days are spent standing on the corner of Eastern Avenue and Patterson Park praying to God that that lawyer that drives the Burgundy Cadillac gets off at 5 p.m. as opposed to 5.30 because he pays me good money for my body. How the fuck did I get here? I sat where you sit with goals, dreams, ambitions. And if you're sitting in your chair and you're saying, God damn it, I'm grateful that guy figured it out because like, come on. Don't miss what I'm about to say. Do not miss what I'm about to say. My story was not my story either in the beginning. If you would have caught me at treatment center number one, two, four, six, eight, nine, ten, you would not have got the same story you're hearing today with 13 under my belt. I come up with another plan. I really don't want to waste the time of going back to treatment center number 12. Why? Why? I decide I'm going to write a book. Now I have no high school diploma. I got my GED in the penitentiary, but I decide that I'm going to write a book. 
I go to the Barnes and Nobles, I, I get a book of one of my favorite authors. I look at the outline of his book, his book's written in 12 chapters, pen to paper, I write 12 chapters. I take my 12 chapters, I hand them to who today is my co-author, a very intelligent man with letters in front and behind his name. He turns my 12 chapters into 23 chapters. We acquire a literary agent through my, one of my best friends, that guy Bam, his manager gets me a literary agent. My literary agent shops the manuscript around. A whole lot of no's, a few yeses. We come to an agreement with Kensington Publishers, Citadel Press. The book does insanely well. Selling hundreds of thousands of copies around the world. New York Times top 10 selling author. I'm now a published author who's written an autobiography addiction memoir. I'm receiving mail from all over the world of people like you, Ma, saying, I read your book. I didn't want my story to get as bad as yours. I have 30 days. People like you, Ma, saying, I read your book. I understand when my daughter picks the bottle as opposed to coming to have dinner with me on the weekends. It's not that I'm a bad mother. It's that she suffers with a disease of alcoholism. My delusional brain just interpreted that as I just wrote the Big book of Alcoholics Anonymous. But what I forgot to share with you is I wrote that book while heavily under the influence of of endless amounts of red wine and copious fucking lines of cocaine. The night my book's being released in Times Square in New York City at the Barnes and Nobles, it's a a big well-to-do thing in the scholarly world. My, My family's there, my literary agent's there, the publishers are there, all these people have come because yet again, I might just be onto something. But the only problem is I don't feel good that day. I don't have any dope. And I looked to my assistant CJ and I said, CJ, I need you to give me $100. He said, absolutely not. I will not aid and abed you into fucking up yet another chance. Maybe the last one you have. And I said, CJ, do I need to remind you whose payroll you're on? And he said, I will not help you destroy your life yet again. Now see, I'm at this book signing of my own autobiography addiction memoir and I have a buddy of mine with me from Baltimore as well and he's sitting like where you're at and, and he doesn't feel good either and, and, and we take a look at each other. We don't say a word but we have that complete conversation, that language of the heart untreated if you will. And all of a sudden they wheel my books in, in these boxes on this dolly and, and me and my buddy, we stand up in uniform precision. I go over, I grab two boxes of my books. He grabs two boxes of my books. We've just stolen four boxes of my own autobiography addiction memoir books from my own book release party to take back to Baltimore to sell to get money to buy more dope. How the fuck did I get here? We sell the books, we shoot the dope. He goes his way, I get on a train. I go back to Westchester, Pennsylvania. I go to my second ex fiance's house, I walk up the door and a, and a common theme in my story is that locks stop working, right? And on this day, the locks stop working, so I... I kick the fucking door in, right? And when I kick the door in, I realize that she's taken everything. She has taken our paintings. She has taken our furniture. She has taken our cats. She has taken our clothes. And, and at that moment, I, I fell to the ground and I found myself lying in a fetal position, crying uncontrollably. And at that very moment, it dawned on me that this home is now a spitting image of what I have become. This big empty shell of a house now consoles this big empty shell of a man lying on the floor in a fetal position crying uncontrollably. And guess what the only thing I can think of at that very moment was? That gentleman from that first treatment center that said, do yourself a favor and don't turn 18 in a place like this. Because yet again, I found myself in a position that if I just would have fucking listened to him with an open mind and an open heart, I would not have ended up. And with that, my phone goes off and it's my mother. And I doubt many of you in this room will remember, but around eight years ago in Baltimore City, the police killed a young black man by the name of Freddie Gray. And when that incident occurred in Baltimore City, it turned Baltimore into the movie The Purge. Right? They were robbing, they were looting, they were shooting, they were stealing, they were burning blocks down. Uh, the, they brought the National Guard that came in and stood on every other corner with a machine gun and a tank and they infused the 8 o'clock curfew. No one was to be on the streets. And my mother lives around 15 blocks from where this incident occurred. And I'm lying on that floor in the fetal position and my mother called me and she's crying and controlled me. She said, Brandon, I'm terrified for my life. Can you please come make sure they don't burn my house down? My mother, 
My mother is someone that I will do anything for. No questions asked. I will do any fucking thing for this woman. She's loved me when I didn't love myself. She's fed me when I didn't feed myself. She's bathed me when I didn't bathe myself. She's, she's prayed for me when I didn't pray for myself. You name it, I'm fucking there. Point to the sword and I'll jump on it in a heartbeat. She's crying uncontrollably. Brandon, can you please come make sure they don't burn my house down? In theory, my plan is to get up from that floor, go back to 30th Street Station in Philadelphia and catch the train right back to Baltimore to make sure she's as safe as humanly possible. In theory, that's the plan. <laughs> my disease said, that's real cute, bitch. That's real cute, bitch. Let me show you what your actions are going to fucking look like. You're going to get on this train. You're going to go back to Baltimore. You're going to go back to this mother's house that you love so much. And you're going to walk up into her bedroom and you're physically going to remove this 78-year-old woman from her bedroom. You're going to take that bedroom over. She's going to take the sleeping on the sofa in the living room out of fear. Because, see, I'm going to stay in her bedroom for three months. I'm going to leave it once a day. And I'm going to sit in that bedroom and I'm going to chain smoke and I'm going to shoot dope. And she's going to be in fear that because I keep shooting dope while, while, while chain smoking, I fall asleep. And she's in fear I'm going to burn her house down. So her next best thought is if she sleeps on the sofa directly next to the front door and I catch her house on fire because I'm falling asleep while shooting dope, she could probably make it out alive. Every day, man, every day at 4.30, my eyes would open religiously. I had no alarm clock. I didn't have a phone that woke me up. My disease knew when the, every morning, 4.30, religiously, my eyes would open and I would gently open her door and I would, I would sneak down the stairs because God forbid I stepped on the wrong stair and it made a noise and it woke her up and she'd say, Brandon, can you make me something to eat? Not right fucking now. Not right now. And I get to the bottom of these stairs and I would get on all four and I would army crawl over to the living room sofa, a.k.a. her bed. And, and this hand would grab her purse and this hand would grab the bell that she's attached to her purse. And I would gently slide it over to me because God forbid that bell rang and she woke up and said, what are you doing? Don't, don't fucking do it, mom. Don't do it. And every day without fail, I would slip her debit card out. I'd hit the corner store bodega and I'd hit the ATM for $180. And I go up the way, I cop the dope and the coke, and I come back, and one day I make it back to my mother's, and I go to put the key in the lock, and the lock doesn't work. So I politely knock on the door because I love my mother. I can't kick her door in. You see the disconnection from reality that's already taken place? The abnormal has become the normal. I'm simply living on that animalistic level where I merely live to use and use to live. Have no problem making her sleep on the sofa in fear of her life because I'm going to burn her fucking house down. Have no problem taking $180 every day for three months straight, but God forbid I kick her door down. Whoa. So I politely knock on the door, and in this particular day, my hot shot attorney brother from D.C. drove down to her house. See, my mother refused to go upstairs into her bedroom because, like, ignorance is bliss. And, and what mother wants to watch their son kill himself on a layaway plan one bag at a time? So if she didn't walk up those stairs, she didn't really have to accept how bad my reality was becoming and that that plot was probably going to be used soon. On this particular day, my brother drives down from D.C. He physically walks her up into that bedroom, and that bedroom looks like a murder scene. There's blood on the ceilings, there's blood on the walls, there's needles, there's cookers, there's bags, there's ties. If you can relate, God bless you. If you can't, thank fucking God. So with that, they collect my belongings. I see my mother being helped to the front door, crying uncontrollably. My brother has everything that I own. She opens the door and she looks at me and she said, Brandon, Brandon, I you can no longer stay here. You have to go. I will no longer love you to death. And I said, I knew that my words held no more weight. I was sick of my own fucking voice. I wasn't trying to walk my way out of this. All I could do was say, do you hate me? She said, I I'll never hate you, sweetheart, but I will no longer love you to death. And with that, my brother hands me my worldly belongings. 
15, I'm doing a commercial with Michael Jordan, touring the world with the Bones Brigade. In those movies, Jackass, TV shows, Viva La Bam. Become a New York Times top 10 selling author of an autobiography addiction memoir. I've done some things in life people equate to success, happiness, potentially even dream of doing. May 25th, I'm standing on the stoop of my mother's house in Baltimore City. My brothers just handed me everything that I own, which consists of eight scarves, two jackets, three socks, a stick of deodorant, a needle and a spoon that fits into a bag that doubles as my pillow. And with that, a police officer comes around the corner and he said, excuse me, son, are you Mr. Novak? I said, yes. He said, this is for you. And I opened it up in his restraining order and he said, I promise you, boy, if I catch you back on your mother's premises, I will not be so kind. How the fuck did I get here? I don't know about you, but I had goals, I had dreams, I had ambitions, I had aspirations. I was going to be somebody. And who I was not going to be was my fucking father. How did I get here? I'm a 38-year-old homeless heroin addict who stands on the corner letting men blow me for a living. How the fuck did I get here? I want to kill myself so goddamn bad, I'm just terrified to hurt myself in the process. Terrible suicide because I keep waking up. And I finally found myself in a position where I'm so low the curb looks like a skyscraper. With that, I take my worldly belongings, I'm walking up the street and my phone goes off and it's this woman on social media. She said, hey Novak, I read your book, it saved my life and I could give a fuck less because I don't even want mine right now. She said, what do you say about an all-exclusive paid trip to Fort Lauderdale? I said, that's great. I need some heroin, some cocaine, some Xanax and some wine. She says, no problem. Red flag number one, my book saved her life but she's going to give me substances that take mine. But what the fuck ever. She's paying for my airfare. She's paying for the food and boarding. Most importantly, she's paying for the drugs. See, what I forgot to share with you is that I am to see my parole officer tomorrow morning at 8.30 a.m. in Chester County, Pennsylvania. It's 6 p.m. I'm sitting in a shooting gallery. I have a needle hanging out of my arm. I'm about to go to BWI Airport, board a flight to Fort Lauderdale. I'm supposed to be in his office tomorrow morning at 8.30 a.m. I'm supposed to be in Pennsylvania. I'm not supposed to leave the state of Pennsylvania and I'm supposed to produce a clean urine. The delusional alcoholic brain that I possess that lies to me in my own voice that makes me believe the unbelievable says, don't worry, get dressed accordingly. Hurry up and get to Fort Lauderdale, meet the woman, get what you need to get from her, and you'll make it back in plenty of time to produce this clean yarn for him tomorrow morning at 8.30. It's physically and humanly impossible. Even if I have a private jet at my disposal, I'll never pass this yarn for this man. But I believe it so much so that I got to get dressed accordingly because my, my parole officer's name is Matt Pfeiffer, and his nickname is Maxim Out Matt. So that kind of might give you an understanding of the fellow that I'm dealing with. So I get dressed accordingly because I can't look disheveled for Matt. So I put these at once point in time, nice pair of dress slacks on if you overlook the cigarette hole burns. I don't wear underwear at this point because like I get fucking high. I don't wash them and find imaginary dressers and imaginary alleys. I fucking shoot dope, man. I put this nice button up shirt on and these at once point in time, nice pair of Brooks Brothers shoes, but I lost a shoestring along the way. So when I go in to cop a few bags from the boys before I board this flight to Fort Lauderdale because I don't want to get sick on the flight, I, I cop from the boys and, and the boys see fit to rob me as opposed to serve me. So they decide to rip my front and my back pockets completely out. Now my dick and my ass are completely exposed. They rip my shirt open. The only button that stays buttoned is this very top button and I got these shoes on with one shoestring. I'm now roaming the streets of West Baltimore looking like a gay East L.A. Cholo gangbanger, right? <laughs> I'm glad you think my fucking demise is really funny. <laughs> so the plan doesn't go accordingly. I make it to the airport because God forbid I miss this flight because I'm on a tight timeline. I got to make it back to produce a clean urine for Matt in less than 12 hours. And I get to the airport and I get up to the counter and the woman takes one look at me. And she said, Mr. Novak, are you under the influence of anything? And I said, absolutely not. 
So he said, I believe that you are and you will not fly for three days. Not like the next flight out or tomorrow morning for Christ's sakes, three fucking days. This is that full circle moment. Remember in the beginning of my talk where I told you I found myself in a position where I was divinely inconvenienced and the God of my understanding showed up and created just a big enough gap between me and the last speedball that I shot to allow me to have that moment of clarity to see what my life really looked like was and I was no longer accepting of it. Here's that moment. I don't want to go to Fort Lauderdale. It's hot, it's sandy, I don't know the hustles. My heart is beating like I just shot 20 kilos of cocaine. I do not want to get on Fort Lauderdale. I don't want to get on that plane. But my disease said, bitch, when I want to know how you feel, I'll ask till then, act accordingly, and get on this fucking flight. And I'm standing there and the woman takes one look at me and she said, Mr. Novak, you will not fly for three days. Now see, my perception of this conversation was this. The woman knows who I am, her kid's an addict, and she blames her kid's disease on me. How dare her piss on my parade? The reality is anybody dressed the way I was dressed would not be allowed to board a flight, let alone walk outside the door here. Two things I've learned in my career, I will never win an argument with a judge or a TSA airport security agent. <laughs> what they say goes. And now see, having been sober, coming up on eight years, finally having done the internal work that was required, meaning the 12 steps of Alcoholics Anonymous, it's allowed me to have the external results that I've always desired, meaning I have a very clear perspective on reality today. It's very easy for me to look back and recognize the synchronicity in life's events that have led me to the right here, right now, that proved to me the God of my understanding has been doing so much more for me so much longer than I could ever conceive. So if you're sitting in this room, Mr. Day One, if you're sitting in this room and you're waiting for the miracle to take place, please allow me to be the first person to tell you it's already fucking happened. It's already happened. If you can't see it, I understand. If you can, welcome. What I know to be true today, the God of my understanding dressed up in the form of a TSA airport security agent and did for me what I could not do myself, which was deny me access to that flight. And I stepped out of line and I got back in the corner and I called that same sponsor that I acquired from my therapist just so, you know. And I said, Lex, I'm stranded at BWI airport and I want to kill myself. He said, nah, Slick, that's not what you're going to do. You're going to come on a train. You're going to jump on the next train. You're going to come back to Philadelphia. You people, I was not buying what you were selling. I was not drinking your Kool-Aid. You people were my father. Fuck you. You people are going to leave your cookouts. You're going to leave your family. You're going to leave your loved ones. Memorial Day 2015. You're going to come pick this hopeless, helpless alcoholic up such as myself. You allow me to spend the night with me. You take me to see your, my parole officer, Matt Pfeiffer, in the morning. Matt Pfeiffer grants me one more shot. He sends me back to the same facility I had been to four previous attempts over my 13 overall. And, and I'm sitting in the same chair with the same in co intake coordinator without foul. And generally what my intake process would look like is this. Okay, Mr. Novak, your insurance will cover you for 90 days. And my rebuttal to that was, in theory, 90 days is great. But in reality, I'm more of like a 45-day kind of fella. Right? I have this woman to fuck, this job to fulfill, and this state to go to. And she would gently laugh at me each and every time and say, sweetheart, you have no idea. Because anything and everything that you put in front of your recovery does not or will not matter. It will go. Memorial Day 2015. May 25th, 2015. For the first time in my life, I had finally been demoralized in just such a fashion from drugs and alcohol. I had been beaten into that state of reasonableness. And I sat in the same chair with the same intake coordinator and she gave me the same offer without fail. The only difference was on this day when she gave me that offer, I could not come back with a counter offer because if I said the word no, it entailed an explanation. And I swear to God for the first time in my life and thank God the disease of addiction had beaten me speechless. All I could do was shake my head yes. And she said, sweetheart, you're in no condition to do your intake. Get up to detox. I'll see you in four days. I take my eight scarves, my two jackets, three socks, stick a deodorant needle, spoon, restraining order, my gay East LA cholo gang banging outfit. And I stroll up to the detox and I'm met at the front door by this 19 year old tech. He said, Mr. Novak, you're back. And I said, aren't you a fucking genius? <laughs> you don't miss a beat, do you, boy? He said, Mr. Novak, I regret to inform you, your clothes are not rehab oriented. You need some underwear. 
You need some sweatpants, you need some slides. And I had heard you fucking nut job caught like people say shit like, a grateful addict will never use again. A grateful alcoholic will never drink again. And it didn't make sense until it made sense. And on this day, I'm standing next to this fucking 19 year old tech who's smiling from ear to ear and he's reprimanding me on needing underwear. And for the first time in my life, all I could say to myself, cause God forbid any of you heard this, was please God, let me find a pair of underwear. He said, it's okay, Mr. Novak, don't worry. Come with me, we're gonna go to the basement, we're gonna go to the donations room, we're gonna see if we can find you some used underwear. Now that laugh I'll fucking relate to. <laughs> Everything else, you're fucking insane, but that I can relate to. Because I don't know where you're at mentally, but I don't know if you heard, my mother's a nuclear physicist, my brother's an attorney in the White House, first skateboarder, doing the thing with Jordan, fucking traveling the world with Pal Peralta, in these movies, break box office records, New York Times selling author. Did some things in life people equate to success, happiness, potentially even dream of doing. The reality is I'm a 38 year old fucking alcoholic standing in the basement of my 13th inpatient treatment center next to a 19 year old tech as he's thumbing through these boxes looking for some used underwear and I'm praying to God that he finds them. How the fuck did I get here? I got here because I sat there with a closed mind and a closed heart comparing out, focusing only on the differences, not the similarities because I possess this job that consists of knowing everything and I'm defined by nature. I hate authority and I'll never fucking conform. Why? Because I know. I'm praying to God he finds these underwear. I'm praying to God, please God, please God, please God. He's smiling from ear to ear. I am the least confrontational person you'll ever meet in your life and it comes from things I've endured as a child with my fucking biker father. But on this day, I've never wanted to knock someone's head off so bad in my life. How dare he be so happy in my presence? Right, it had been so long since I smiled or found anything to be optimistic about that if you did it in my company, I took it fucking personal. I'm praying to God he finds him, I'm praying to God he finds him. And at that very moment, two things had just taken place that were going to forever change the course of my life that I was completely unaware were happening. The very first thing was I went from that job that consisted of knowing everything to realizing that what I do know is I have no idea. And my very best thinking places me in a basement with a 19 year old kid as he thumbs through a box looking for some used underwear and I'm praying to fucking God that he finds him. He's looking for the used underwear, he doesn't find them, but what he does find is a pair of size 40 women's sweatpants with no drawstring, a woman's tank top, and a pair of size 13 Jesus sandals. I don't know how alert or attentive you are, but I'm not a woman and I do not wear a size 13. But at that moment when this kid handed me women that, clothes that did not belong to my gender or shoes that did not fit my feet, I was overcome with a sense of willingness unlike anything a human has ever produced. And at that moment in time, I realized that I was just met by the God of my understanding as a direct result of that gift of desperation. My pain was becoming my purpose all unbeknownst to me. I had no idea any of this shit was happening. I was just trusting in the process and realizing and believing that my way no longer worked. And clearly like your guys does. Cause every time I call, you're here like the fucking furniture. Hands me the clothes, the shoes. I go upstairs. I, I've never been so excited to put women's clothing on in my life. Get that Baltimore City smell off me. Put these clothing on. I successfully complete this 90-day treatment center. And in this 90-day treatment center, they taught me things like if I changed my perception, I could change my world. And that one day my defects, the very same thing that was killing me on a layaway plan, one bag, one bottle, one needle at a time, could become my very same thing that's considered an asset, the very same thing that my dear friend Cherie says, hey, come out to my facility and share your message of promise, hope, and freedom to the gentlemen and women in my program so that maybe they can find enough power within them to make it through another day clean and sober. I successfully completed that 90 day treatment center. From there, I went to a sober living house where I resided for one year. On oh, my nine months of sobriety, my mother called me, the very same woman that served me with a restraining order, the very same woman that prayed for my death, the very same woman that, that, that took life insurance policies on me, the very same woman that bought me a plot. She called me nine months into my process of sobriety and she said, Brandon, I hate when you come to visit me. And I said, why? She said, because I get so sad when you leave. Two months shy of my two year anniversary, I signed my release papers. See, from 18 to 38, I was on parole or probation every day. 
It just followed me from city to state. Never a free day in between. Two months shy of my two year anniversary, I signed my release papers. I'm literally a free man that can go anywhere with anybody, anytime I like. I no longer live in that self-induced prison that consists of a four block radius that cost me $10 to get out of one bag at a time. For my two year medallion, I decided I was going to fly to Paris to an Alcoholics Anonymous meeting and collect my chip. For my third year anniversary, I bought my first home. For my fourth year anniversary, I went to Amsterdam to an AA meeting and I got my four-year medallion. Most people don't equate Amsterdam and recovery. <laughs> but the reality is, as a direct result of the 12 steps, I've experienced a spiritual experience. The definition of a spiritual experience is simply a psychic change. Meaning that I, Brandon Novak, today no longer think how I thought when I was sitting in this chair with two days sober. I'm a free man that can go anywhere with anybody, anytime I like, as long as I know that I suffer with a disease called alcoholism, not alcoholism. And I cannot stay sober on yesterday's sobriety. My sobriety has a shelf life of 24 hours, meaning I have to do a few simple things along the way each day to maintain my sobriety. On my fifth year anniversary, I listened to what you fucking nut jobs told me and you would say things like, in order to keep what you have, you have to continuously give it away. And I took heed to that because my sobriety is very precious. So I promised myself that I would recreate the sober living house I got sober and stayed sober in. And on my fifth year anniversary, I opened up one men's sober living house in Wilmington, Delaware, titled Novak's house. One house with 10 beds. Today we have six houses with 65 beds. May 25th, 2022, I celebrated seven years of continuous sobriety. I'm currently in the process of opening my own drug and alcohol treatment center that God willing will be open by no later than next Monday. What I've learned to be true is that sobriety has given me everything that drugs and alcohol ever promised me. And my history does not have to dictate my future, but it can most certainly guide and direct it. And most importantly, the disease of addiction is not a death sentence. As long as you're breathing, it is never too fucking late. I'm gonna close with this story because I'm sure half of you fucking junkies wanna smoke. I quit, so I don't care. <laughs> not my problem. There's a father that works from home, right? There's his father that works from home and he's swamped at paperwork and, and he's watching his child and his child keeps banging his dad on the knee. Dad, take me out to play, take me out to play. Father swamped in paperwork. He's trying to figure out a way to buy two or four days. The father walks into his office and in his office on his desk is this big picture of a puzzle of the world map and the father thinks to himself, I got it. And he completely dismantles the picture of the puzzle of the world map, throws it on the floor in hundreds of pieces. He says, son, when you put that picture of the puzzle of the world map back together, I'll take you out to play. Father leaves that office, surely thinking he just bought two, four days, no questions asked. Fucking two hours later. Dad, I did it. Dad, I did it. Dad's thinking to himself, impossible. He walks back into that office as sure as the day is long, the picture of the puzzle, the world maps put back together. Father, in complete disbelief, said, son, how did you do it? Son looked at dad and laughed. Dad, it was simple. Dad, it was so simple. On the back of the picture of the puzzle of the world map was a picture of a man. I put the man back together. The world fell back in place. Together we stand, divided I die. My name is Brandon. Thank you for your time.